Thank you, Pastor Mark, for such a powerful presentation. So many people receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. Was that awesome or was that awesome? Say yes. Mm -hmm. I want you to help me. I'm going to read from a very controversial book in the Bible. I know for some people there are no controversial books in the Bible, but there really is. There is no book that has been as disputed and debated as the book of the... Oh, my dear. The book of the Revelation. One say Revelation. Right. I threw you when I said the book of the, because for many of you, the book is called Revelations. Let's turn to Revelations. Never heard that before? Well, there is no Revelations in the Bible. It's the Revelation. And I'm going to be reading from the Revelation, chapter number 17. Revelation 17, I'm going to read uh, verses 12 through 14. And if you have a Bible, a phone, an iPad, or any other electronic device that has scripture on it, then you might want to read with me just in case I'm misreading. Hmm? Cool? All right. <clears throat> And this won't take long. Oh no, how long is a piece of string? Hmm? <laughs> Woo! And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is King, he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Somebody say amen. amen. I'm going to speak into your life from the subject this afternoon, evening, against all odds against all odds. Is there anybody here that has ever had the odds stacked against you in life and against all the odds you rose to achieve your goal and to experience victory? Someone say amen if that's you. Now, I want you, before I go into this, because I'm going to go really deep. I told Seth I'm going to give him two years of preaching material in 30 minutes. Ta-da! He didn't believe me, though. They never do until I do it, right? So we're going to have fun. But just before we go in, I want you to join me in offering up to God a very specific sort of praise. I think you know, but I'm not sure. Praise is not meant to be a mindless, mechanical response to a cheerleader, right? We're not supposed to just say praise the Lord because we're told to say praise the Lord. Now, it's a good idea to say praise the Lord when you're told praise the Lord, but there's supposed to be something more to it than a mindless, mechanical response to a cheerleader. Actually, praise is an intellectual process, which is why whenever the Bible says praise the Lord, it says... Praise him for, for something. In other words, there's a reason. You have to locate in your mind a reason why you deem God worthy of the noise that you're going to make. You make the noise because you intellectually rationalize the fact that he is worthy of celebration, hand clapping, dancing, screaming, shouting, music. And there are only three reasons why we praise him. Now, by the way, you know praise is different to worship, right? Hello? Praise is different to worship, yeah. Because you actually worship him because he is God. He is worthy. You worship him whether he is good to you or not. Whether you experience his goodness or not, we worship him, all right? But we praise him in response to something he has done. And all that God has done can be split into three categories. Someone say three categories. So we praise him for the past, what he has done in the past. Yes? 
That's when you look back over your life, you think things over, and you realize that if it hadn't been God who was on your side, you wouldn't be at Bethel Convention Center today to say anything whatsoever, and you, you get grateful for what God has been to you in the past. Is there anybody here who's grateful for God in your past? You can see God all up in your past. Would you give him a praise for that right now? Go ahead and praise him for your past. All the things he brought you through, everything he brought you over, every circumstance he brought you out of, he is worthy of that praise. And then God is at work in your present. That is what happened for Mary and Martha. When Lazarus died, they said, Lord, if you would have been here past, my brother would not have died. Jesus said he will live again. And they said, we know he shall live in the resurrection at the last day. Future, they had a God in their past, they had a God in their future, but they didn't have a God in their present because sometimes the God in your present is not as obvious as is the God in your future, as is the God in your past. Because we have the tendency to look back over our lives and see God at moments that when we were in those moments, we could not see God at work. So we have to understand that even if you cannot see God at work in your life today, he is working behind the scenes, moving in mysterious ways, setting you up for your next miracle. So even if right now is your darkest hour, I dare you to praise God in the darkness for everything that he is doing right now. Could you give him a praise for that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. And here is the most potent, powerful form of praise. I call it prophetic praise. And it occurs when you look out into the future and you see God doing in your life everything that he promised you. And you begin praising him for tomorrow like it was yesterday because you feel like it is already done. So I want to remind you of this. Now listen, when you offer up that kind of praise, you will knock down your wall of Jericho. I wish I had some help in here. You will knock down your wall of Jericho. Your wall of Jericho is anything standing between you and everything that God promised you. So hear me very carefully. If God makes you a promise, he is not telling you what he's about to do. Oh no. He is telling you from eternity what he has already done. And if you praise him like it's already done, guess what? It will happen. I dare you to praise him right now like it's already done. Hallelujah. Oh, glory. So I'm smiling about some things right now that have not yet materialized in my life, but because he said it, I know it's a matter of time before it happens. All right, sit down, touch your neighbor, say, I am already blessed. I have taken the risk of reading out of the book of Revelation knowing that there has not been a more debated and disputed book in the canon of scripture we have so many schools of thought surrounding what we call eschatology, the, the doctrine of future things, that people are pretty much scared to preach out of Revelation, to read out of Revelation, to mention Revelation, because there is every chance that someone in the audience will accuse you of having misinterpreted the Bible. When I went to Bible school, we had different sorts of millennialists. We had the pre-millennialist, the post-millennialist, we have the amillennialist, we, we had every different version of millennialists, and then we had the tribulationists, who were pre-tribulationists, mid-tribulationists, post-tribulationists, we had doctrines about the rapture and the revelation, the antichrist, the beast, the false prophet, the harlot, the red dragon, the mark of the beast, new world order, Freemasons, Illuminati. I mean, we had it all down packed. We knew when Russia was going to invade uh, Israel and we knew what China was going to do and we had all of this stuff and we were so dogmatic with it. How many of you actually know me for a couple of years? Anyone here that actually know me for a couple of years? My God, am I getting old. Years ago, there wasn't anywhere I could stand up and say that. Well, mummy's on the set. Mummy knows what I'm talking about, all right? So, so we got so dogmatic about it that we boxed ourselves in and we 
couldn't have fellowship with people who saw things a different way. So let me tell you that even though I'm going to deposit in your spirit a thought from Revelation, you have my permission to totally disagree. You can even send me a letter, drop me an email, Facebook me, Twitter me, and say I totally disagree. I promise you I will not respond. But the book of the Revelation is not the book of Revelations as in plural, but it is the book of the Revelation as in singular. And Revelation does not mean a mushroom cloud, a mindless nuclear war. It is from a Greek word, apocalypsis, which means to uncover, to unveil, to make known, to make clear, to manifest, to appear. And so the revelation, singular, is that which God wants you to see. And there is something that God wants you to see, which is why quite deliberately and strategically, this book ends up at the end of the New Testament collection because... After everything you've read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts, Romans, the epistles of Paul, of Peter, of James, there is something ultimately and finally that God wants you and I to see. The book of the Revelation is about something we must all see clearly. Would you nudge your neighbor and say, we've got to see this. Now, it is a book of metaphors written in prophetic picture language, which means that we have pictures, we have imagery, we have metaphor. And those people that try to be very literal and, and uh, uh, with the prophetic pictures run into trouble because they end up on the beach. They end up on the beach with binoculars looking for the beast rising up out of the sea. Well, I've been waiting for years for the beast to come up out of the sea with my binoculars and still has not come. You know why? Because you've taken prophetic picture language and you've made it literal. So these are metaphors which demand interpretation. Everyone say interpretation. We will differ in terms of the meaning of the metaphors. We will. I am convinced that the Bible interprets its own metaphors and that you can look in other places to see what does a beast mean what does a dragon mean what does a horseman mean you will find interpretations of the metaphor but i am happy ultimately that there is no definitive are y'all still with me i'm happy that there's no definitive explanation of the metaphors in revelation I'm happy about that because I can take the metaphors and make them apply to circumstances that I am going through in my life right now. And because there's no definitive proof of the meaning of the metaphors, then in every generation, Christians have drawn comfort from the book of Revelation. I mean, before there was a computer, before there was a monetary system that relied on marks and numbers as opposed to cash and coins. Christians drew strength from Revelation because you could always interpret the metaphor in the way that was most obvious to you. So that throughout the Roman, the Roman uh, era, as Christians were persecuted, they went to the book and they were encouraged from Revelation because even in their generation, they could see something in the book. In fact, I'm convinced that if you see this, you can survive any storm. I wish I had some help in here. If you see what I'm going to show you, what I'm going to unveil tonight, you will be able to survive any storm. You will survive a season of struggle and you will come out of it with an extraordinary attitude and a mighty victory just because you see something that other people cannot see. What is the difference between those who sink and those who swim? Hmm? What is the difference between those who survive and those who don't in the middle of a trial, 
it is ultimately what they see. So God says, I want you to see something. And in 10 minutes, I'm going to show you what it is. Would that be all right? Thank you. There is a clue in the book as to what it is God wants you to see. For Revelation is a book of sevens. Everyone say seven. There are seven stars in the right hand of him who stands in the midst of seven golden candlesticks. There are seven churches. And from thence, a seal, a book sealed with seven seals. From the seals, there are seven trumpets. There are seven bowls of wrath. There are seven things which shall be no more, as in no more crying, no more death, no more sea. If you count them up, there are seven. This is a book of seven. There are seven spirits before the throne. It's a book of sevens, and seven is God's number signifying a finished work. Everyone say a finished work. It is God's number that signifies the conclusion of a matter, the end of a thing, the finality. So we get to the seventh day, the week is ended. On the eighth day is the first day of a new week because we conclude the matter on the seventh. So since this is a book of sevens, it is a book all about how everything is going to conclude, how it's going to wind up, what will be the end of the matter, the conclusion of the matter. So God says, I want you to see what the end shall be. I want you to see the conclusion of the matter. But there's something about the conclusion that we got to see. You there? The very first words are this, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Everyone say of Jesus Christ. Which means this book is supposed to show us Jesus, supposed to show us Jesus more than anything else. Sadly, we typically come out of the book with a clearer vision of the Antichrist, the beast, the false prophet, the harlot, and everything else. But actually the book is not about that. The book is about Jesus Christ. And there is a dimension in which he must be seen. And when you see him in that dimension, it will give you the strength to survive your season of struggle. Somebody say, praise the Lord. So I'm going to show it to you now as follows. In Revelation 17, du -du -du -dum, we have a beast. And you know when the Bible describes, calls it a beast? It is a reptilious creature. Something out of a movie. But this beast, this reptile, has seven heads. I mean, if it had one head, it's scary enough. But this thing has seven heads, probably quite independent, all moving, talking to each other. Can you imagine that? And one of the heads has ten horns. Ten horns. John says, these shall make war with the lamb. Hold on a second. What's a lamb? Lamb is a baby sheep. Right? And a sheep is a totally defenseless creature. Right? Sheep do not have horns to butt you with. They don't have fangs to bite you with. They don't have claws to rip you with. Sheep are totally defenseless creatures. They absolutely rely on a shepherd. But these shall make war with the lamb. The lamb. Oh, okay, so watch this now. Seconds out. In the blue corner. Watch this. I want to know where you would if you was a gambler, any gamblers here? Don't put your hand up. If you was a gambling person, I wonder where you'd put your money. In the blue corner. He stands with an undefeated record of pure wins. He has seven heads and ten horns. 
He is ferocious and can rip anything to pieces. His opponent in the red corner. I wish I was light. You can do this. <laughs> the lamb. <laughs> the little bouncy soft. How do you feel when you see a lamb? When you see a lamb, you feel guilty for eating mutton, curry goat, you guilt. The lamb is so, now some of you just feel hungry, you see a lamb, but you see a lamb. And the lamb is like a little pet, you want to take it home, and so you want to cuddle it, you want to protect it. But in the red corner we have the lamb. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, place your bets. You know what the world would bet on? You know what most people would bet on? They would put absolutely everything on the beast with seven heads and ten horns, yes? Because there's absolutely no way, absolutely no way that a little lamb has any chance of defeating a seven-headed reptilious beast with ten horns. The Bible says these shall make war with the Lamb. And then I get so excited about this next bit. It says, and the Lamb shall overcome them. Because he is King of kings and Lord of lords. Now you're looking at a picture, you're looking at a metaphor. But it's a powerful metaphor. Because it says against all the odds. The Lamb will prevail. And believe it or not, that is the entire story of the whole Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, it is the story of little people doing big things by the help of God. It is the story of little people overcoming big obstacles by the help of God. It is the story of little people replacing big people because God said it's time to move. I don't know how you think about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but the truth is they were nomads. What? Nomads! You wouldn't have looked at them as being powerful, significant, or important. I don't know how you think about Joseph. But the truth is he was a convicted criminal in prison for a heinous crime against an officer of Pharaoh's wife. He had no chance of ever living his dream. I stopped by to talk to someone who feels just like that. That I am in such a mess. I have no chance of ever becoming what they say I can be. It's too late, Bishop. But the whole story is the beast versus the lamb. Joseph is in prison and in one day, oh God, I love this, 24 hours. He is elevated from the pit to the palace against all the odds. I stopped by to tell you that against all the odds, Moses led Israel out of Egypt. And if you've ever been to Egypt and seen the might of the pyramids and seen the size of the Sphinx and seen the majesty of the ancient Egyptian empire, you could understand that a group of slaves never had a chance of humbling a pharaoh. But because ours is the story of against all odds, those little slaves brought an empire to its knees. David versus Goliath is against all the odds. Esther versus Haman and Ahasuerus is against the odds. Nehemiah rebuilding an outlawed city against the law with funding and resources from the law was against the odds. Job surviving the loss of everything and his health that was against the odds. 
Daniel surviving the lion's den, that was against the odds. Jesus rising from the dead, that was against the odds. And because Elijah knew that God loves it when the odds are stacked against him. Elijah said to the false prophets on the mountain of Baal, soak the sacrifice with water. Because my God loves it when the odds are stacked against him. Now, if my whole Bible is an against the odds story, you can't tell me that I can't live my dream. You just can't tell me that I'll never achieve my goal. You can't get me to think small. Don't even try to squeeze small mindedness into my head because my history, my ancestry, my story is against the odds. Now, I wish I could preach in here, but my time is up, so I better say what I came to say because I came to prophesy tonight. Is that all right? But see, everyone's not going to receive the prophetic because some of us have pathetic mindsets and paradigms. But for those of you who even listen remotely to what I told you, that the whole story, the whole story is the beast and the lamb. It's the lamb prevailing against all the odds. Your mind might be open a little bit to what I'm going to prophesy to you. Are you ready for the prophecy? And I know some of you feel like he's not prophesying if he ain't shaking. He ain't prophesying if he don't say, thus saith the Lord. That's just because you don't read your Bible. I understand. You watch TV, but you don't read your Bible. But for the rest of you, you will understand that what I'm going to say to you is prophetic. You are living in transitional times more turbulent than anything your fathers and forefathers have seen. Actually, every conceivable institution and power structure is being shaken right now. Right now. I mean, people who felt invincible are shaking right now. People who looked down at you years ago are in jail now. Politically, the world is shaking. No office is safe. The likelihood of a Barack Obama becoming president of the United States 10 years ago really didn't exist because he's a very unlikely candidate. Barack. I mean, you got Johnson, you got Lyndon, you got you know, Reagan, you got Clinton, Barack, Hussein, Obama. Because everything's shaking, it's different. In the corporate world, everything's shaking. No one's job is secure at the highest level. The chairman, the CEO, everything shaking in every sector of industry. Everything shaking politically, economically, Every currency in the industrialized world is fighting for its very existence. Every country in the industrialized world is trying desperately to make ends meet. You know why? Because a shaking is taking place. A shaking is taking place. And everyone who is praying, oh God, please stop the shaking. You're praying against what really God is doing. Because what God is doing is he is shaking the nations one more time. Shaking it up one more time. Shaking it up one more time. And the reason why he shakes it up one more time is so that the things which cannot be shaken might appear. Which simply means that whenever there's a shaking and whenever there's a breaking, there's a gap. Everyone say a gap. And with the gap, there's an opportunity. Everyone say an opportunity. And so I stopped by the t- 
tell you that in the aftermath of this shaking, some very unlikely people, some very unusual suspects, some very disqualified people, little Miss Nobody and little Mr. Nobody, little David, <laughs> little people, in the aftermath of this great shake and quake are suddenly like Joseph was catapulted from the pit to the palace like Daniel went from a lion's den to a greater destiny like Esther went from her rags to her riches all of a sudden ordinary people little people against all the odds are going to become powerful people Wealthy people, influential people, the loudest voice, the biggest industries. I prophesy to you, our day is here. It is fast approaching the time when God will catapult little miss nobodies, unknown, underrated, overlooked, insignificant people are about to run things in this world. Now, you don't have to agree with me. I'm just telling you that from Genesis to Revelation, that is the pattern. I want those people who believe that in 12 months, God could make you a millionaire just to stand on your feet and begin to praise him right now like you are crazy. I want, hold on a second, hold on a second. I want those people who believe that this time next year your local council will not be able to make a decision without consulting you and your organization. I want those people up on their feet to make some noise in here. You know what? I just want those authors in here, those budding authors in here, who believe that quite possibly in a 12-month period, you and your little book could become the next big thing to outdo Harry Potter and his entire series. I wonder if that kind of a person is here. I wonder if you know that that's God's style. It's his style. Oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord. It used to take years and years to build a great church, but there's a preacher in here somewhere that is believing that somewhere in the next 12 months, you're gonna get that church started. It's gonna be on the map. It's gonna be growing. You're gonna have property and you're gonna have people. I just want you to help me to praise him a little bit right now. I tell you what, I pledge my allegiance to the Lamb of God. Against all the odds, we are going to prevail. We are going to win. We're going to run things against all the odds. I stand by the Lamb. I stick with the Lamb. I stand with Jesus Christ. I don't care how big their systems are. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because thou art with me. You see, when you're a lamb, your strength is the shepherd. When you're a lamb, your faith is in the shepherd. And then he says, thou preparest a table before me. Woo. That's a banquet. That's a feast. I used to think that was in heaven, but that's not in heaven. He said, it's in the presence of my enemies. So while my enemies have breath, guess what? They're going to live to see me blessed. They're going to live to see me blessed. I don't want any of my enemies to die. They're going to live to see me blessed.
Thou anointest my head with oil. That is my authorization to operate in a God-given office. That is my authority, my right, and my ability to do what God called me to do. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. You know what that is? That's not enough. That's more than enough. God gives me more than enough. God don't give me enough money. Give me more than enough. Don't give me enough power. Give me more than enough. Now listen, you know what's happening here? I did not call for an offering tonight. The Holy Spirit called for it. But he's calling. Please leave the baskets to the side. He is calling for people to pledge your allegiance to the Lamb of God. I am in his corner. They that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. I'm in the Lamb's corner. And you know what it's like in a boxing match, in a fight? The entourage comes in huffing and puffing like they're getting in the ring. So sometimes the beast comes with his entourage of people who want to stare you out. But God said he would make my face harder than theirs. So I stare out, I stare out the businessman, I stare out the politician, I will stare out anything in my community, I stare out the gangster and the gunman, and I'll stare you out because you know what? With all your horns and with all your fangs, you cannot beat the Lamb of God. I pledge my allegiance to the Lamb of God. Now here's where the psalm finishes. Surely goodness, <laughs> and mercy will follow me all the days of my life that's your entourage goodness and mercy as i walk through the streets of birmingham london manchester coventry oxford i move with a heavenly entourage goodness and mercy following me all the days of my life can't touch this devil can't touch this devil his rod and his staff they comfort me i don't care how big your fangs are how big your horns are i am blessed i just leave the basket on the side now i'm gonna give you a chance in one minute to sow into into this anointing but watch this what i'm going to share with you now is pure revelation listen up first corinthians chapter 1 verse 25 when you go home check it out it says for the foolishness of god is wiser than men and the weakness of god is stronger than men That baffled me. You know why? Because God is the omni. He is omnipotent. He is omniscient. How can he have a foolishness? How can he be weak? How could the foolishness of God exist? How could the weakness of God exist? Then I saw it. Brother Seth, receive this. And your whole team received this. I saw it. When a covenant is cut between two parties, the two parties become one party so that the weaknesses of the one are absorbed or counteracted by the strength of the other. So you have two tribes in covenant. One is farmers, the other is fighters, warriors. Now. The farmers cannot fight and the warriors cannot grow crops. They cut covenant so that the warrior tribe can say, we have food. And the farmer tribe can say, we can fight. They are not saying it because they can do it of themselves, but because they are in covenant with someone who can. So when God cut covenant with you, you and he became one new unit which means that the weakness of god is me 
The foolishness of God is me. But the weakness of God, which is me, I am his weakness because he's attached to me. The weakness of God is stronger than men. And the foolishness of God is wiser than men. So that even with my weakness and my foolishness, because I'm in covenant with God, there is no devil in this nation that is a match for me. Because me and God are the majority. I want everybody in this place get an allegiance offering in your hand right now. It could be 10, it, may, it must be a sacrifice. I don't care if you're sacrificing a Burger King, a McDonald, but it must be a sacrifice. So get 10 or 20 pounds in your hand. And if you don't have it, ask your neighbor for it. Get in your hand. This is going to be an allegiance offering. Because you know what? I pledge my allegiance to the Lamb of God. I'm on the winning side. I'm so on the winning side. I want you to get it. Then I'm going to pray on your life and anointing. And we're going to come and run. And we're going to bless this conference. This is not my offering. And you know what? You know I'm telling the truth. I've never taken a penny from this meeting in five years. And never even intend to. The other, you know, I, I just, I don't. This, this is God. This right here. With all its weakness and foolishness. is the weakness and foolishness of God. It's better than men. That makes sense? I always come and give and sow. So we're going to give and we're going to sow. I want you to get that in your hands right now. Now watch this. Come on, come on. Get it in your hands right now. Because this is what we're going to do. I'm not taking my phone. Praise God. You know what I'm saying? Hold it up high in the air. Hold it up high in the air. Get something in your hand and put it up high in the air. Hallelujah. Say, I pledge my allegiance to the Lamb of God, to Jesus Christ, the living Word, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. I am with Him. I am called. I am chosen. I am faithful. And against all the odds, Against all the odds, we win. Against all the odds, we shall overcome. Against all the odds, truth will triumph. Against all the odds, righteousness will prevail. Against all the odds, I am rising. I am ascending. I am blessed. I am blessed. I am blessed. Against all the odds, I'm coming out. I'm coming over. I'm coming through against all the odds in Jesus name in Jesus name now watch this what is the likelihood that a mother of five could run three businesses raise very very strong children in North London where guns pop off like you know what was that oh it's just a gun run three businesses tithe to her church then command the attention of the BBC Sky News World Service by organizing a community march to march through the streets of her city, attracting hundreds of followers in the street to demand that the community turn against the gun people. What is the likelihood that that could happen? Do you know what? It's against the odds. But she's here, she's right here. Hazel, come out here. I want you to come out here. I do. I need you to come out here. These are her sons right here. 
by herself. Now, I should tell you this. All that stuff that she did, she didn't come and say, Bishop, I need some money or I need uh, an office in the church or a department or I need a... No, she's just a mom, concerned mom. And she said, no, enough is enough. She runs three businesses, raised great boys. Some of them are not here right now. They're too big to get in the building. <laughs> she did the whole entire thing. So I didn't bring nothing with me. I just told her, you bring your stuff because we need to hear you, what you're saying. So you visit her table when you finish. That'd be all right? Okay, thank you very much. You can, you can go. And as for me, I didn't bring nothing with me. You know what? Because I want whatever I was going to give to you, I want you to put it in this now. But please hit me up on Facebook. Who's on Facebook? All of you are on Facebook. I know you're all on Facebook because this guy's Facebook is climbing every second, right? And I know he knows all them people as well because everyone don't know all them people that they have on their Facebook, right? But he knows them. Hit me up on Facebook. Tell me about this message. Follow me on Twitter, Business Bishop, Wayne Malcolm on Facebook. Now, I pledge my allegiance. I tell you what, I am going to prevail over every adversity that, is, that is, comes against me because I am with the Lamb. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Every tongue that rises against me shall be condemned. And everything is working together for my good because I love God and I'm called according to his purpose. And I pledge my allegiance to Jesus Christ. I'm not going nowhere. I'm not swapping sides. I tell you what, I'm with him. He is with me. And we are going to win and we are going to prevail. If your vision is that this thing become a festival with 10,000 people in it, then in the name of Jesus, that's what it's going to be. And I want you to join us in sowing right now an allegiance seed offering come on so right now now father god as we pledge our allegiance to the jesus team we are declaring that we can see the victory i want you to put it on the altar if you would please just lay it on the altar just want to see it all right lay it on the altar we'll put it in the buckets afterwards lay it on the altar okay so we pledge our allegiance to the jesus team and yes in jesus mighty name we are blessed in the city, in the field, when we come, when we go. We're blessed in our uprising, in our laying down. We are just blessed because we are with the Lamb. Hallelujah. We are so with the Lamb. Yes, yeah, so with the Lamb. God bless you so much. And this is, you know what we're saying here today? We are saying this that this midnight oil is moving from an event to a movement because it's a movement of people who are not taking no for an answer it's little David standing up to Goliath it's little Esther saying if I perish I perish but I'm going to see the king it's little Nehemiah, who's the cupbearer to the king, saying that even though there are laws preventing the rebuilding of that city, I'm going to make a request. I'm going to request the unrequestable, the unthinkable. It's a little Syrophoenician woman pressing her way through to see Jesus. It's the rise of the little people. It's the rise of the ordinary people. It's the rise of the no name. It's the rise of... God bless you. I love your spirit. Because this is this is the this is the rise of the ordinary people. God bless you. Please play on the altar. Would you do that? Lay it down, lay it down, lay it down, lay it down. <laughs>